A few years ago, I was fortunate enough to be picked out of seven people in the world to be in a commercial for Jägermeister. So they flew seven of us to Prague to film a commercial cool. for cool. a brotherhood that they picked one person from every aspect of a sport that they wanted oh. to pick. So they picked myself from NASCAR, they picked Keyshawn Johnson from football, uh, Rob Smets from PBR, bullfighting, uh, Nathan Fletcher, big, great, big wave surfer, Freddie Roach, who was uh, Manny Pacquiao's trainer, uh, Mr. Cartoon, uh, Mark Matrado, that's a famed tattoo artist in uh, California, and uh, Kerry King from Slayer. Welcome to Mosaic Minds, the podcast where every episode is a colorful blend of perspectives, ideas, and conversations. Each week, our diverse team of hosts brings their unique backgrounds, experiences, and interests to the table. Mosaic Minds is your invitation to join the conversation to see the world through a kaleidoscope of viewpoints. So grab a seat, tune in, and let the mosaic unfold before you. Mosaic Minds tonight, I got uh, Crystal and Nick with me here, uh, podcast co-host of Mosaic Minds. Tonight we're going to have our first guest, so we're excited. We uh, went through some um, uh, tech uh, things tonight, and uh, we're excited to have Mike on tonight. So just a quick bio of Mike. Um, He's a retired NASCAR tire changer with 25 years of experience. He worked in the shop as a mechanic and on the road crew. He's won seven cup championships, eight pit crew championships, won 99 cup races over a 25 year decorated career. Avid fresh and saltwater fisherman, retired recently due to injury, and currently the general manager of two boat dealerships in North Carolina. So Mosaic Mines crowd, let's give a warm welcome to Mike Lingerfeld. How you doing tonight, Mike? I'm good, thank y'all for having me on. I look forward to having some fun with y'all tonight and talking a little bit of everything. Sounds like a good plan. We're excited to have you. So uh, we're going to get started by just asking you a few questions here, Mike. Um, walk us through a typical day in the life of a NASCAR uh, tire changer during your active career. You know, the according to which day of the week it is, right? I worked in the shop as well. So we'd be at the shop at 7 o'clock uh, doing a normal job. Then at some point in time, you'd have to break off, go to the gym, work out. Then at some point during the day, and everybody's schedule kind of changes through the day, but later in the day, you'll go pit practice. Then you'll go back and do your job. So it's kind of a a two-part job, you know, working in the shop as well as changing tires. But you do the practice during the day. Then uh, sometimes we did two-a-days, like football guys. Then for the most part, it was one a day, go back to work. And uh, the hard days for us was actually the weekends right so uh, most of my career i was on the road crew and the pit crew so i flew out on wednesday or thursday and i'd work on the car during the actual race weekend then when sunday would come around i'd change tires but at points in my career i was just a tire changer worked in the shop and that consisted of getting up at two o'clock on sunday morning to go over to the airport climb on one of our private planes to fly us wherever across the country we was going uh, land up wherever we was going about the time the sun got up, go to the racetrack, set the pit box up, um, do our pre-race routine, get ready for the race. By the time the race started, you've been up for nine or ten hours already. Then you're expected to go out, do a good job, then uh, get finished with the race, tear down, fly home, get home at 2 o'clock in the morning, and be back at work at 7 the next morning. Help out the crowd a little bit here, Mike. Over that uh, decorated 25 years of doing various tasks there on the NASCAR circuit, what was the names of some of the drivers you worked for? I believe I know one, but I'm going to let you tell me rather than be wrong to the audience. Yeah, so I'll start out with, you know, I don't count a few of the years for the simple fact that um, it wasn't cup racing. So I count the cup years, but I started out with Marty Ward uh, in South Carolina, then uh, Shane Hall, Jason Keller, then whenever I moved to Cup, I went with 
RCR with Skinner and Earnhardt, changed tires on Skinner's. Um, spent three years doing that, left, went to Gibbs, spent five years with Tony Stewart on the 20 car, left, went to Roush, Yates, which it, which is commonly known now, but it was Yates at the time. Spent three years on the 38 with Elliot Sadler. Uh, left there, went to the 48 for five of the best years of my life with the 48 with Jimmy Johnson. Left there and went to Roush and pretty much worked for everybody that was in the building at Roush over that time. And, you know, it sounds like you move around a lot, but we're – we're no different than some of the football guys. Everybody runs on contracts. So you work on a, you sign up for a three year contract and sometimes they extend it. At the end of your three years, you might find a better contract somewhere else and it makes sense for you and your family to go move and change jobs. So, you know, you stay anywhere about three years as long as you both like each other. Then if the contract warrants it, you extend it a couple of years if it don't you find the next best contract you can find for yourself and just kind of bounce around a little bit toolboxes have wheels for a reason who was your favorite race team or what was your favorite race team that you worked for uh, you know everybody every team has something fantastic about it right um rcr up at childress's and yates for the family aspect Great human beings, great people to work for. Loved every minute of it. Um, obviously, with Tony Stewart and Jimmy Johnson, you win a lot of races. You win a lot of championships. And um, you just get to see a different perspective from the different teams. You know, So all of them have great things about them that, that makes it the best. Even though you, it's hard to put your hand on just one that's, man, this is the – absolute best thing ever in the free world you just can't do just one team yeah that's cool you've been with some of the highest end uh there uh, tony stewart is kind of a hoosier uh the dirt track that he started out many years ago is actually about 20 miles from where we're kind of doing this podcast so that's a very good connection um so uh yeah. it sounds like in 25 years you've had a lot of really cool experiences what are some of your most memorable moments you know, obviously winning the Brickyard is huge for me. I've been fortunate enough to win the Brickyard five times. Wow. So, wow. Uh, a couple of them stand out in general. You know, we was up there and I think it was 2008-ish. We had the little tire debacle and we was having to pit every six laps, eight laps or whatever it was. And uh, we won that race based on pit stops and pit stops alone. And that meant a lot. That was a really cool race to win, get to kiss the brakes again, and um, that was a little emotional for me. Bristol's always emotional, uh, especially when the crowds was in Bristol and you had 400,000 people stuffed in a half mile. It was really cool to win Bristol. Anytime you won, I was fortunate enough to win there four or five times. I think folks on the Brickyard, man, that's really cool to see. You know, Penske's done a lot of work on there, and he's making it more of an experience, so I'm super proud of that, you know. Looking at that track, the historic lore of it, uh, kind of restoring the roar and making it more of a uh, community event, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and uh, kind of beefing it out. Nick's going to toss you a, a question as well. Did you? Have, I know you, you were saying that, you know, there's really no way to, to say what your favorite race team was, but do you have a favorite track? I mean, and you don't have to say, uh, you don't have to say Indy just because, you know. <laughs> I, I can promise you, Indy is not my favorite track. It's my favorite, one of my favorite tracks to win at. But Indy's huge. Um, the way it's laid out, you don't get a lot of airflow down pit road at Indy. And when we're up there, the time of the year they bring us in there, it's hotter than Hades in there. So Indy is not my favorite place to go. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I really, really like Bristol just for a simple fact that. When they stuff that place full of people, and they're doing, they always do God Bless America before the Star Spangled Banner. And when they do that, when it's 100% packed, it makes your heart skip a beat. I bet. Because it's so loud in there. That's cool. I think the NASCAR always respects our country, and I really appreciate that. You know, very similar to fishing. You know, they do the they do the Star Spangled Banner, and they make a <laughs> stand, you know, kind of do that. So I think that's good. So... 
Walk us through just a little bit about the transition between that lifestyle and then the uh, general manager of the boat dealerships. Uh, I know you from fishing more than I do the NASCAR circuit. I've gained, you know, um, friendship with you over the years, but walk us through a little bit about what maybe a day-to-day -day ops looks like for you right now on your, um, I know it's more than nine to five, but we'll call it a nine to five. Yeah, you know what, honestly, what the transition that happened was I got injured again, obviously, um, we're coming up on a pretty big anniversary for me uh, for injuries. I've got injured a few times changing tires. February 20th of 2000, I broke my femur at Daytona. Uh, then I've tore some tendons off the bone and this and that. Then um, the last injury was a shoulder injury, and it kind of put me to the point to where I couldn't change tires anymore. And I was to the point to where it'd be a good time for a change. And the only thing I knew other than race cars was people and boats. So it was a good transition for me. Uh, so now I GM two boat dealerships uh, here in the Charlotte region. Uh, we carry eight lines and we are do a lot with a little. We're a very small family owned dealership, but uh, we do a lot. And I'm also the service manager, the sales manager, and the GM. So I wear a lot of hats. Um, I wish it was a nine to five, but it's. Uh, I this said that lightly. I'm seat. just establishing the full time position. But yeah, you know as well as I do, that's probably more like a five to eight or, or what. You know, different hours, different days, different seasons. So I, I can appreciate that absolutely. Well, and this is a bad time of the year for us. We did the Mid Atlantic Boat Show last week here in Charlotte. And between Monday morning and Sunday night, I worked 99 hours. So it's uh, it's like, it's actually worse than racing for hours this time of year. You mentioned uh, you mentioned injuries, and that was kind of what caused the transition. You don't you, when you think of a pit crew, you don't really you know well, at least for because I'm not a huge racing person, so you don't really think about the pit crew getting getting injured. So is that a real common thing? And what usually causes those injuries just the takeoff of the of the car or how, how does that work um you know most of the time it is we only get to leave pit wall one stall before our car gets there um and it varies the length of the pit stall varies from racetrack to racetrack and the speed in which they're coming in varies racetrack to racetrack from 35 mile an hour to 65 and at the most you get about 35 feet to jump out in front of it running 65 mile an hour and if the driver misjudges where he's stopping or locks the brakes up the next thing you know you're on the hood over the roof laying out there on the ground hey educate me real quick here so if i'm coming into indy you know we don't want to go always back to that track but we're familiar with that track so your racer comes in he's pitting what is considered a stud um exit time at a racetrack like Indy because that I think that gives a perspective because very good question by Nick but I'm curious to see how you're going to answer that uh, actual pit stop time so it's changed so much over the years for the fact that um, we was doing four tire pit stops with seven people four tires 18 gallon of fuel we was getting them down in the high nines low 10 second range uh, with five lug nuts so then they tried to slow us down and they made the wheel studs longer so you had to have a thread showing and you couldn't use your hand speed and that kind of backed them up to the mid 12s and then they started taking people away to slow us down that moved it to 13s then we got them back down into the 12s then now they went to one lug nut in the cup series with less people and it's got it back down into the tens and elevens now why would they want to slow you guys down well i'm not in nascar anymore so i don't have to be politically correct <laughs> there you go. I like it. I like it. it's uh it's money motivated right so you get you get stud athletes with good hand-eye coordination and it becomes a bid more and you want to hire the best people you can for your pit crew so you know there's only so many really really top-notch number 10 athletes out there that can do it so it become a bid more and they was having to pay the tire changers and tire carriers and jackmen more and more and more so the owners would complain 
and then they would try to make rules to slow us down so it would kind of level the playing field out to where a guy that was an 8 and not a 10 could get the job done in the same amount of time and the owners and the teams could save money. Gotcha. I think if you look at multiple sports, like there's there's debates out there, but I think the ball and baseball, for instance, was more lively than it ever has been because, the you know, the stitches are always the same, the weight's the same, but you know as well as I do. I think the home run ball is kind of what everybody's looking at uh, to switch sports with you. Um, if I can uh, switch one more sport with you here, so your, um, your passion for fishing developed – how do you find it complements your professional life with you already having success on the track? How does that translate over to the water, whether it be fresh water or salt? You know, the fishing's more, you know, I enjoy it. It's a lot of therapy for me, especially when I was racing. Um, when I go out and play fish, it was the entertainment that just let me relax, chill out, have a good time fishing. Uh, the tournament side of me when I'd fish the tournaments was just the same as when I was on pit road. I want to do the best I could, fish as hard as I could, and just give it everything I had for however many hours they let me fish for a tournament. But now I don't do as many tournaments. Um, with my shoulder, I can't fish hard for eight hours straight right now. So I'm uh, I'm more into play fishing right now, and whether it be salt water or fresh water, you know, I, I get to fish Norman. Anytime I want to, it's 35 foot behind my house. That's a real fishery there, man. In Indiana, it's tough. Um, the waters are tough. But I think a perspective that I want to share with the audience here and kind of correlating it ironically to your day there on the NASCAR circuit is, you know, you're waking up. You know, I personally wake up at 2.30 in the morning, drive a couple hundred miles. You're in a boat 8 to 10 hours. You know, you're dehydrated. You're fighting through. Uh, you're making some stuff happen. And at the end of the day, it's kind of that's that's your goal and expectation. And then you have kind of the winding down, the driving home, the getting back home. So although a lot of different stressors, still very hard on the body, you're very tired. Uh, you don't get immediate injuries, I don't think, in fishing. But, you know, as well as I do, if you're casting, you know, 75, 80, 100,000 times during the year, that shoulder and elbow is eventually going to bother you and everything. So you can definitely, uh, definitely see that. Talk to me a little bit about the high pressure environment that you have. Um, maybe let's say, let's say you're trying to make up time, or you're, you're coming to the end, or you're trying to win a uh, point scenario or standing. Uh, talk to us a little bit about that on the NASCAR side. So the the biggest thing about the high pressure side of it, it was extremely high pressure. You know, I was fortunate where I kind of had a switch. I could be standing on pit road, hanging out with you, talking, laughing, carrying on. Then when it's time to do my, do my job, I could just flip a switch, get up on the wall, and go do it. Um, I never let the, the pressure really get to me. Um, but there's obviously lots of pressure in it. Everybody in the shop, the road crew, the pit crew, the shop crew, everybody relies on the guys over the wall to do a good job because those 400 – People plus that work at the shop every week with the multi-car teams, they have no control over if you suck or not. So if you go out there and you have a bad day and you suck, you directly affected those 400 people in the shop as well with their bonus, with the win, with everything. So that's that's where I felt the most pressure. It wasn't actually doing the job. You could do the job because you practice so much. It's like second nature. The pit stop itself is easy. You know, it's the the snipers that come out and hit you during the pit stop that make you screw up. You don't go out there and screw up for fun. You know, everybody makes mistakes. Um, but we're graded on a stop-by-stop -stop basis, and you're always expected to be perfect. But if you can, if you play baseball and hit a 300, you're going to be in the Hall of Fame. And... We bet a 300. You're looking for a job. I was going to say you're a free agent. <laughs> yep. Do you have any yeah. like rituals that you do before going to, out to a race to like kind of like get pumped up, like music or workouts or? You know, I, I was actually the opposite. I was chilled. Um, you, you had plenty of guys around you that had their big headphones on 
pumping herself up, smacking herself in the face, jumping off pit wall, waving her arms. So you're just like, like a, meditating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they look like you on pre workout right before the pit stop. They're jumping around like you you, you think they. You think they got stung by a bee in the ass or something, the way they're jumping around trying to get warmed up. And you're like, man, just do your job. Is that called, so that hard. Is that called speed? No, I'm just playing. <laughs> what do you miss yeah. the most about NASCAR? Uh, honestly, I don't miss a whole lot about it other than the competition. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I miss I miss the competition. I miss doing the pit stops. Um, I miss a few of the people, um, but I really I really just miss the competition. And that was uh, that's one of the things that drove me as hard as it did for as many years because the average lifespan of a tire changer, you know, for doing that career is only about seven years. So I had a few careers built into one. So, you know, I just... So you're really enjoying the the boat dealership thing you seem like uh, you seem like the kind of guy i'd want to buy a, a boat from i mean you seem pretty genuine and laid back and you know so is that is that kind of your your groove now yeah i mean i, we, I still do my dirt racing stuff i grew up racing dirt cars so when i want the the excitement side of it i'll go run the dirt car stuff and kind of still get a little bit of racing in me then the boat side um i know boats and i know people you know so it's easy for me to, to go in and get my guys motivated to do a good job and, and be a team player and everybody pulling in the same direction. Um, we sell really nice boats. It's easy to, they're easy to sell. They sell themselves, you know. So it's uh, just a matter of putting the right people in the right seat of a boat. And it's really, really enjoyable. Because any point in time during the day that I want to, I can pretty much go out on a lake and do a test drive. So. Oh, there you that's go. Not, yeah, that's a better that's test not, drive than you know, yeah. If you ever, you ever, Well, yeah, we yeah, talked we, a lot about your career. What do you do for fun? Besides fish. The, the, yeah, besides <laughs> fishing. Like, what do you do for fun that we would never guess? Uh, honestly, I'm pretty damn bored. <laughs> if, I'm, I'm not, if I'm not working or fishing... Um, I fish a lot in the Keys, so that's kind of my entertainment. I don't, I don't really count Norman as my entertainment fishing. I really enjoy saltwater fishing, so I fly down to Florida. Uh, we got a spot in the Keys, so I fly down there a few weekends during the winter, especially when it's cold here, and saltwater fish. We do stone crab, blue crab traps, so I get a little bit of, I get a little bit of something that. You can't do here, so that's kind of my entertainment. I really don't. Do they have the uh, soft shell yeah. crabs down there? Some of the blue crabs, actually, they do molter shells, so you can find some soft shells, but they're few and far between. That's interesting. Just so the crowd knows, um, I have a, a topwater fishing company called uh, Boing Lures, and uh, Mike, that's kind of how we know each other, or kind of started our uh, friendship. We kind of known each other. Um, that's actually a saltwater lure, as you well know, and it's also a freshwater lure. What do you feel like? Um, like, what are you? What are you kind of thinking? What are you targeting? Maybe when you're saltwater fishing or the brackwater? I'm, I'm really jealous when people get to do that because we're all freshwater in the Midwest. But how does that look a little bit different from the freshwater setup? So, uh, literally, when you get up in the morning, you could look at the weather and figure out what you want to fish for. If if it's blowing out of the west and you're thinking about going fish you're not going to go fish the bay side because it's going to be blowing across the bay uh, you can run out front and you can either get on the hook out at the reef line and catch some yellowtail snapper some trigger fish mackerel uh, grouper if they're in season uh, if you want to get out and troll around if the wind's blowing a little bit harder and you don't want to be on the hook and get your Feel like you're in a washing machine all day you can uh you can troll around catch some mahi sailfish um, high speed troll for wahoo uh, so you, you can pretty much target what you're going to go after based off the weather then if it's blowing out of the east and you're going to get the absolute guts beat out of you you can go out in the backwater and catch trout mangrove snappers you can go out there and if you want to catch something big go shark fish go tarpon fish uh, if you got a bay boat you can go catch snap uh, snook 
stuff like that. But so there's so many options. You know, if you go, if I go out back here on Norman, I'm either going to go for spotted bass, largemouth bass, and you can't target either one really here because the way this lake's set up. Or you can go catch one of the, we got blue cats, channel cats, flatheads, which you're going to target those if you go. Uh, we got alligator gar. And those are the ones a that bunch of different sunfish. Are those <laughs> the ones with like the weird long pointy nose? Yeah, they have the door, like the real long. Yeah. Yeah. Got teeth. Do, do, do y'all eat them up there? No. Uh, no. We don't, but I've messed with them before, and ironically, people say that they put rope on their hooks to catch those around. I didn't like know the they were guys. edible. <laughs> yeah, because they get that so, teeth wrapped around that rope, and they just can't pull off of it. So if you put a little section of rope on there, um, just go so noodling. We go out. Yep. We go out and. We'll go out and bowfish and catch catfish and go. Uh, no, she was from Pennsylvania and she would fish a little, but now she has turned into, uh, she gets to fish more days a year than I do now. Uh, so she's uh, she's very fortunate to where she's she's on the boat today. I, I can she was fishing today. I could probably ask Jason the same question, but what was the uh, what's the most memorable experience that you had that you've had in your uh, in your fishing tenure? I mean, like whether it be danger or just like the craziest fish you caught i mean like what would what would you say is the most memorable moment maybe falling out of a boat <laughs> let me help you a little bit on the let me help that question a little bit i really like that question mike um talk to us about what's a big largemouth bass or a big spot there because in indiana man you, those fish are on steroids there compared to our biggest fish here uh start there with uh with your home lake freshwater so so you know if you want to go here and catch spotted bass you can go out there and catch a hundred two pound bass at any point in time pretty much any time of the year but to go out and catch the four pound six pound uh, we have had a seven this year but we don't get huge huge bass the the water temp here and the oxygen level in the lake really just don't is not conducive to get really really big hogs here but you catch a lot of fish and you can go up the river and catch more largemouth than on the south end but you can catch we'll have 20 pound bags when about every tournament during a weekday here and you can have a tournament pretty much every day of the week here and somebody's gonna have a 20 pound bag you're not gonna have a 50 pound bag but you'll have a 20 anytime you want one back to the the uh, racing just real quick if somebody wanted to let's say this there you had a you know a 12 13 year old kid that their aspiration was to uh, be in a pit crew one day what would you tell someone that was wanting to start out or get into that industry and and also would, would you encourage that it's a great industry to be in it's a hard industry to get into is the problem um, more and more of the pit crew guys are being recruited out of colleges just for hand-eye coordination. Uh, they won't know anything about a race car. They won't know anything about a pit stop, but they'll find guys that kind of have the right build, uh, right mindset, right mentality, and they'll teach them how to do a pit stop. But they won't be car-oriented. So Interesting. You're just, so a lot of people don't understand pit stops and the breakdown of the pit stops, right? So a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to be picked out of seven people in the world to be in a commercial for a Jägermeister. So they flew seven of us to Prague to film a commercial for a brotherhood that they picked one person from every aspect of a sport that they wanted to pick. So they picked myself from NASCAR, they picked Keyshawn Johnson from football, uh, Rob Smets from PBR, bullfighting, uh, Nathan Fletcher, big, great, big wave surfer, Freddie Roach, who was uh, Manny Pacquiao's trainer, uh, Mr. Cartoon, uh, Mark Machado, that's a famed tattoo artist in uh, California, and uh, Kerry King from Slayer. So we was all in this commercial <laughs> that's cool. together. That's random. And... Uh, 
So if you want to go look it up, it's called Jägermeister Seat at the Table. And in my backstory of that, I actually break down a pit stop second by second and tell everybody about how hot the tires are, how hot the brakes are, how long it takes us to do every aspect of a pit stop in the backstory. It's a short backstory. It's, I mean, it's only a few minutes long, but that's one of the things that I did in the backstory is just break it down and, and kind of give the intricacies of what it takes to do the pit stop because we hit five lug nuts in 0.8 seconds. Less than a second, you hit five lug nuts. That's crazy. And yeah, I'll, most I'll, people don't don't understand that. I'll look that up and make sure we get that put on here because that's, that's yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, we'll add that. That's yeah. kind of a, to be recognized, I mean, that's a super honor with, with awesome people from all over the sports world and, and industry. I think this has been uh, this has been fun for us, Mike. I appreciate you being patient with us. You know, as we go on and we advance, you know, we'll, we want you to be a part of it. Uh, we'd be blessed if you have anybody uh, that you would like, you know, to see on, or uh, maybe do a follow up, you know, on down the road. But any 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 last things that you'd like to say uh, to kind of wrap up with the Mosaic Minds podcast? No, I appreciate y'all having me on. I had a great time, and I'd be more than happy to come on again. I got plenty of friends that I'd love to come on. I just had Ish Monroe walk out the door here. He was here in town today, and so we got. I got plenty of fishing friends. I got plenty of band friends. If anything y'all want to talk about? I got people for you. And I don't want to bite myself down, but if I'm ever down there in the area, man, I might have to. Might have We're to just in, all gonna go water, and just so. do the podcast from there. Exactly. We'll just we'll just do a day of uh, test drives in, a day in, in the, the boats. Life. You know what I mean? Just, <laughs> just yeah. do some window gotta, shopping in the boat dealership. <laughs> you gotta be careful coming here. I got a bar in the basement. Oh, oh okay. okay. <laughs> all right. I'm. I'll be on Expedia tonight. I was gonna, <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at plane tickets. Well, Mike, you did a nice job, man. I've, I I was in broadcasting. You've done more of these than I have. You've traveled more than I have, but I'm kind of getting back into it. And uh, you were a very good uh, first or any guest for us because you were just easy to talk to. Um, you expanded upon you know what you've done. You've done a lot of great things. Uh, we share that fishing commonality together. So if I can ever help you, uh, if you need any custom stuff painted up, let me know. I want to do that as a token of appreciation just for you taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, allocate some time to spend with us here in Hoosier Land, okay? Will you do that for, uh, for uh, like, living rooms and stuff like that? If I need a, any custom painting done, can you? I can't do that. Okay, can't fine. That. All right. we, we try. We try. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. I appreciate it, man. You, you're welcome hey, back I'll, anytime. I appreciate y'all having me on. I had a great time. Bye, anytime thank you. Anytime you want to follow up and have another one, I'm in. Okay. I love talking. Sounds good. I think we'd like to have a mini just on that experience that you had, and then I'll let you go after that. But I, I, I think that would be a cool segment, you know, for a mini uh, segment for you and uh, kind of go from there. What, so. the Jägermeister seat at the table? Yeah, Absolutely. I think so, that's, too. That's, yeah, we can, oh, yeah. Yeah. that's a huge story because so they, they contacted me. And they didn't tell me anybody else was in the commercial. It was all top secret. You had to sign up for it, sign the NDAs, whole nine yards. Um, we're in Daytona about this time of year, or maybe it was spring. I can't remember. It was a, it was a spring race uh, when uh, Juan Pablo hit the jet dryer. When he uh, hit the jet dryer, we was already delayed. Then he hit the jet dryer, and uh, the race kept getting delayed, delayed, and delayed. And I was supposed to be on a flight to Prague the next morning. Well, our private plane got grounded because of fog. So I had to climb in the transporter of another team. And I rode in a transporter from Daytona to Charlotte. They dropped me off on the side of the road. My wife picked me up, took me to the airport. We barely made the flight to Prague, get to Prague. Limo picks me up, takes me to the photo or the... Uh, shooting location and I walk in everybody's just happy I finally made it because I was a full day late because the race was delayed and she's like what can I get you I was like I just need a shower <laughs> so I took I took a shower because uh, I left straight from the racetrack never stopped moving and went straight to Prague so I get a shower and we go in to start filming and that's when I see Rob Smith and I've known Rob for years through uh, when I was at RCR, there was a big PBR bull riding affiliation with Wrangler and everything else with Childress's and that whole program. And I met Rob like 20 years before that. 
So I was excited to see Rob. Then everybody else was kind of a new acquaintance for me. So we filmed the whole deal, had a great time, uh, drank a lot of Jaeger. We tried to kill each other. Yeah, yeah, it's like, part of the perk there. We want to give you a last opportunity as a show of appreciation for being on the show. Uh, maybe a um, maybe a last uh, plug for you, if you will. Maybe give a little bit uh, information in 30 seconds or a minute about where your boat dealership is, how we can contact you via social media, kind of give you a platform to kind of throw out. Yeah, if you, got a web, if you got a website or how, how, how do you want people to find you, Mike? Thank you all. Um, I'm actually getting back on social media a little bit more than I have been in the past. Uh, everything's Mike Wingerfelt, whether it be Twitter, Instagram. Um, I do have a Facebook page I'm never on, but I had to have it for uh, for the Jaeger stuff. But um, I'm trying to get more back on social media and kind of keep in touch with some of the people that I hadn't seen in years and uh, and kind of give an update on more what I'm doing because I just once I got hurt. Um, I just kind of fell off the face of the earth until I was healed up enough to where I wanted to to talk to tell anybody what I was doing. Okay. So so Twitter and uh, Instagram, those are your your best best ways to um, follow you. Yeah, and I'm gonna get better at posting. I'm uh, horrible at it right now, but I'm I'm gonna get back on the horse and start posting some more fish pictures. Well, hey, again, we appreciate you being on here, and and we'll definitely have you back. Yeah, thank you. It was Perfect. a lot of fun. Perfect. I appreciate it. Y'all stay warm up there. Hey, we're trying to tie lines to you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.